Okay, um, this, tonight we have um, Stephen White, uh, who's going to talk to us on the Bible and slavery. And um, so Steve is a member of our committee and being um, a, a very supportive person. And so we very much appreciate his contribution. So Steve, I'll hand, hand it over to you and you can introduce your topic. Well, thank you very much, Kevin. And uh, for most of you, if you've done already know, soon it may be Dr. Kevin. He's put his thesis in. So we look forward to being able to call him Dr. Kevin soon. Um, yes, topic, this topic. Um, obviously become quite controversial in the last, well, all of the, well, most of this year. Uh, I first came across this topic as a, something I thought about about a year ago when someone uh, at my church from International Justice Mission spoke about their work. They had uh, reported that they had managed to pay off uh, the debt owed by an indentured labour somewhere in South Asia uh, who was being badly treated and the whole family was being badly treated by the, the uh, person to, to whom they were indentured. Uh, and it was, it was a good news story that they were able to free themselves and uh, the particular person who escaped indentured um, work was uh, very grateful for that. But then the person from International Justice Mission went on to say, and we must abolish all slavery. And I thought, but uh, what about the book of Philemon? And I actually went and spoke to this particular person and, and uh, she became quite upset that I should mention the book of Philemon because it, we'll get to it again, but I just uh, right up front uh, for those that might not know it, it's a letter sent from Paul to a slave owner called Philemon to take back a slave who had run away to Rome. And so we have this book included by the early church fathers as something that shows, yes, um, a slave, a guy who'd been an escape slave was being sent back to his master. So we do have this contradiction within the Christian faith is what is our attitude to slavery? And it was then uh, January when uh, Kevin gathered the committee together and he put the topics that he'd proposed for this year and I we went down the list and I saw slavery and on the basis of uh, my experience with this person from the Adult Justice Mission, I said, yes, I think I should try and attempt this one. Um, in January, not such a big deal, but then I think it was March when, uh, uh, who was, um, George Floyd um, was then, then died uh, on the streets, I think it was Minnesota, and we saw those images and it's obviously become a lot more, well, the whole topic uh, of uh, race, etc., has become far more um, topical, not just topical, but far more um, yeah, controversial is the word I'm trying to think of. So let's make my attempt. And uh, like um, Brian Schroeder, last time we met, uh, I had learned something by going through this. I thought I knew a bit about it, but I've learned a lot more as I've looked into it. And there, right up front, we have that one of the iconic pictures from Gone with the Wind. Um, I hear that, well, I think it might have been May or June, um, one of the streaming services removed Gone with the Wind from, from its streaming service because it was too, uh, too much, dealt too much with the race and the slavery that went on in, the, in, the, in America. And uh, they then re-released it with a, uh, some sort of introductory note that this was a historic event uh, and should not be taken, um, with, that should be taken into account when we watch this. Having said that, I have to say that I look at those two characters there. Yes, uh, on the left, we have um, the very spoiled, very capricious, um, very, yes, a, a rather <laughs> character, Scarlett O'Hara, who really right, almost right throughout the movie is not a nice character. She's so selfish and so on. And yet on the right, we have Mammy, um, who is not afraid to say her piece from time to time and in the end becomes a very uh, much of a stall character. So when my impression of Gone with the Wind actually is the someone like Mammy shines through uh, as a character that most of us could uh, ad very much admire. She indeed, though a slave, has, has got a character that shines through. And for those that might know, 
Uh, I think her name was, the actress's name was Hattie McDaniel. And she actually went on to win an Oscar for her part. Not only that, she was the first African-American to win an Oscar. So um, this portrayal is not, does not do injustice to the uh, African-American there, uh, who, Mamie, who in fact um, played a very good role there and, and became mm -hmm. quite a, um, a, an admired character in that particular movie. But let's move on then. Quick detour. Slavery is not just a human condition, ants do it too. I'm not sure which particular um, type of ant they are, but they will capture larvae of another ant species uh, and then raise them as worker force for their colony. So yes, um, slave labor is certainly part at least of the, the ant insect uh, part of the animal kingdom. So we're not the only ones. So what I'm gonna talk about tonight, apart from the ants, I've already uh, got there. I actually am doing perhaps slightly the reverse order of what I might normally have done. Instead of looking at the Bible passages first, because after all that was the slavery in the Bible was what it was all about, and the title, I thought instead, as I tried to wrestle with how I would portray it, that I'd actually start with a something that we'll get onto shortly, the biblical interpretation of slavery during the US Civil War. I mean, most of us think of the US Civil War, we had the picture right on the title slide of uh, Gone with the Wind, and that, to most of us, and indeed with Black Lives Matter and so on, that is probably the focal point of much of the discussion of slavery at the moment. So then we'll run through the Bible passages, we're starting with Noah and ending up with Paul and Peter's teaching down at number seven. I'd then like to look at a couple of Christian characters who had a large influence on the church's view of slavery. And then not just stopping with the Bible, I want to look at what happens at least one other major world religion. So let's proceed. Right. Uh, as I did wrestle, as I say, with this topic, uh, yes, I know all the Bible verses, but how can I interpret them? We've obviously heard that lady from Interjust International Justice Mission said her bit. And I came across this, um, it was an online version from the, uh, by this man called Darius Jalovich, um, Avondale College of Higher Education, uh, an Adventist mission uh, in 2016. It was a hermetics of slavery, the Bible alone faith, and the problem of human enslavement. Um, obviously, if we read the biblical passages, and I've already alluded to one of them, then it does seem fairly clear that the Bible accepts slavery as part of what is there and uh, makes no prohibition of it. And uh, if you were to be saying Bible alone, then yes, what's the problem with slavery? So let's go on then. And I guess the one of the major things I got out of um, this particular writer uh, was that our upbringing influences our attitude to slavery. That's not necessarily going to be accepted by all, but this Darius was an Adventist minister in the US for 26 years before he wrote this piece, The Hermetics of Slavery, The Bible Alone Faith and the Problem of Human Enslavement. As he studied it, and uh, we'll take some other excerpts from it, he grew up in communist Poland and admitted that his opinion on slavery was formed by his communist education that decried slavery as oppression by the ruling class. He points out that those in the US South before 1863, when Lincoln abolished slavery within the Union, they likewise grew up with slavery as the norm within their civilization. He accepts that the Bible, Old and New, said, quote, old and New Testament quotation on slavery never condemn it, even though they do regulate it. Now, this is the, the one I picked up in July this year uh, as I was starting to prepare it. Um, the BBC uh, website, a Nigerian journalist, a novelist, uh, I don't know how to produce her, pronounce her name. She went on to say that one of her uh, rights, that one of her ancestors sold slaves, but argues that he should not be judged by today's standards or values. Um, this is the name of, his, uh, of her ancestor, lived at a time when the fittest survived the bravest excelled, 
the concept of all men are created equal was completely alien to the traditional uh, religion and law in his African sub Saharan African society. It would be unfair to judge a 19th century man by 20th first century principles. Well, if that was to apply, then why are people pulling down statues today? Assessing the people of Africa's past by today's standards would compel us to cast the majority of our heroes as villains, denying us the right to fully celebrate anyone who is not influenced by Western ideology. So she's actually, this is a sub-Saharan African from Nigeria saying it's Western ideology that is against slavery. Igbo slave traders like my great grandfather did not suffer any crisis of social acceptance of legality. They did not need any religious or scientific justifications for their actions. They were simply living the life in which they were raised. That was all they knew. Now, I found that almost astounding to read that because of course, if any um, person from European basis were to say that, they would be very much condemned. But let's now look, uh, going back to actually Darius's uh, thesis, the paper that he wrote, the US first Great Awakening revival, 1723-1750, was largely Calvinist and, I'm just gonna get rid of these, and uh, was led by Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield, both of whom owned slaves. The Calvinist belief is that our position in life, this life and eternity has been predestined in God's foreknowledge. The Calvinists largely hold a pre-millennial view that Christ will come down to earth to set things right after the world has descended into wickedness, then reign for a thousand years. The US Second Great Awakening, though, was largely Arminian. It aimed at perfecting both the social order and the um, individual so the millennium could begin. Arminianism focused on love as the primary attribute of God as well as human free will, and thus encouraged social transformation as an outgrowth of the gospel message. It had a post-millennial outlook that Christ would come back after the gospel had brought social justice throughout the world. Pro-slavery theologians tended to concentrate on individual statements in scripture, constructing a theology of societal order that was applicable at all times to all men, I've given the reference there. In contrast, anti-slavery Christians tend to focus on the grand themes of scripture, such as the love of God, his moral law, creation in the image of God, freedom, equality, redemption, and restoration. So I found that um, summary of what Darius put together helped me get a grip on why we have this disagreement within the Christian church. Yes, there are Arminians and there are also Calvinists, and we do tend to differ on quite a number of things. And that, as I say, gave the understanding of why you could have people preaching in the south of the US, that slavery was certainly acceptable in New and Old Testament times. Yeah. Um, therefore, why not today? And similarly, of course, those in the north, uh, was it was Harriet Beecher Stowe that wrote Old um, Uncle Tom's Cabin, and others who were more on the character of God without the individual verses. So now let's look at the scriptures. Having, if you like, painted the big picture and we'll now get into the detail. Um, first of all, just reminding you, there are different types. You had a helot, that was a Greek word, a, a citizen of a city that was in permanent subordination to another city or nation. Uh, in the Bible, we have the Gibeonites, descendants of Canaan, who were made woodcutters and water carriers for the nation of Israel after they deceived Israel into promising they would not be wiped out. God had told, commanded Israel to wipe out all the Canaanites. And for those who invite you to read chapter nine, the Gibeonites saw what was coming and decided they would uh, play some deceit and got a promise from Joshua that they would not be wiped out. Uh, so yeah, read all about it. And not only happened in Israel, uh, as I say, Helot is a Greek term, and the Greek city of Messenia was reduced to peasant duties and, uh, by uh, Sparta. Uh, indentured servant, I already talked about someone who was released from that uh, by international justice mission. Someone who sold themselves in slavery to repay debt. 
Once they'd served the length of time to repay the debt, they could go free. A chattel slave, the perpetual property of his or her master. That is perhaps, if you like, the, 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 the uh, most, the, the deepest degree of slavery. In, Bi in a Bible translation, um, we see the name servant used quite a bit, and that does in fact mean slave. So as I went back to the Bible, so well, where do we first hear about slaves? And as far as I can determine, uh, Genesis chapter nine is where it starts. A few years after the flood, Noah gets drunk on the wine from grapes he has planted and lies naked in his tent. His son Ham sees this and tells his brothers. Shem and Japheth cover their father while looking the other way. And when Noah realizes what's happened, he curses Ham's youngest son, Canaan. In fact, what they, what they said, he said, I curse Canaan. He'll become a slave that must serve his brother. And he said, I praise the Lord, the God of Shem. That's the oldest brother. Let Canaan become Shem's slave. And similarly, I pray that Canaan will become Japheth's slave. And just a reminder who these characters were, or in fact, uh, where Canaan fits into the line of descent. These are the sons of Ham. Cush, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan. Notice it's the youngest son of Ham who gets the curse. To say the curse, Noah must have known of slavery in the world before the flood. And my, this is my comment. Slavery, it appears, is as old as prostitution. prostitution. Just as we say, prostitution is the oldest... Um, um, well, the oldest, uh, the oldest job in the world. Uh, so it seems that slavery was just about as old as that. We can only speculate why Canaan was selected for the curse. There is no reason given in the Bible. Why would you select the youngest son? Why wouldn't you select Ham? We just don't know. In both the Old Testament and ancient Egyptian records, Cush is the forebear of dark-skinned Africans. So the curse does not apply to sub. Saharan Africans that some have twisted these verses to justify slavery of dark-skinned people. It's not in the Bible. Canaan is the ancestor of the Canaanites, whose wickedness God punished by giving their land to the descendants of Jacob, descendants of Shem. But both, just a reminder that not all Canaanites were indeed cursed. Both Melchizedek the one who appears again in the book of Hebrews and is, uh, appears in Psalms is the one who Abraham himself uh, paid a tithe to was a Canaanite, it appears. Rahab, too, um, the um, ancestor of King David, were Canaanite. That was also a Canaanite. So not all Canaanites were cursed. Canaanites settled Tyre, then Carthage, and Spain. So Hannibal was a Canaanite, too. So not all Canaanites appear to have suffered the curse that we know of from Noah. We also remember that Abraham himself had slaves. Uh, the first man who God, who God called his friend. Uh, we had the verse, Sarah gave her Egyptian servant, remember servant means slave, Hagar, to him. She became like another wife for Abraham. Abraham, rather. The Bible says that Abraham had two sons. The mother of, this is in the New Testament, the mother of one was a slave. And that, if you like, refers back to the Old Testament birth in Genesis. Hagar was a slave. The mother of the other son was a free woman. Hagar was a slave. Every male child among you must be circumcised, was the command given to Abraham when he is eight days old. Do it for every male that lives with you, not just your own family. Circumcised servants, that is slaves, have been born in your house. Also circumcised foreign servants that you have brought with money. Let's move ahead in um, the Old Testament. Let's move up to the story of Joseph. Now, many of you would know the Joseph story. Um, Jacob, his father, had a favourite son born to the wife who he wished he'd, uh, the only wife he wished he'd had, but uh, his uh, father-in-law had tricked him into uh, marrying the older sister of Rachel. So we end up having, uh, he has two wives, but he still preferred the son of his favourite wife. And we run along a little bit then. Then the brothers of the other wife 
and wise because they, they took the combines from the um, from the slaves that they had, looked up and saw a group of Ishmaelites coming towards them, riding on camels that carried spices and uh, different I'm kinds of oils. You go ahead if you want. For uh, oils and medicine, taking them to sell to Egypt. I'm, I'm, I am actually truncating this story. By this time, uh, Joseph has been thrown into a uh, pit and the other bro the brothers at that time thought they were going to kill him because they really hated him. And Judah said to his brothers, we could kill our brother and then hide his body, but then we'll not get anything for ourselves. <laughs> One might say, well, there's a Jewish tendency coming through. Let's get the money. So let us sell him to these Ishmaelites. Then we will not have to kill him. We should remember that he is our brother. Judah's brothers agreed with what he said. When the Midianite traders came near to Joseph's brothers, they pulled him out of the dry well. They sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 silver coins. So there we have slavery. You're selling your own brother into slavery. Or own half-brother anyway. Now we're going to skip ahead a little bit. Um, most of you know the story, but please go back to Genesis. Start at chapter 37. I think chapter 38 is a bit of an interlude on another subject. Then keep reading right through about 44 or 45 in the chapter, and you'll find out a very dramatic story. It could be one of the most dramatic stories in the Bible. But uh, to cut a long story short, Joseph, yes, sold to a slave in Egypt. He was about 17-year-old, uh, ends up in jail, falsely accused of something, and then Pharaoh has a dream. The only one that can uh, tell him the meaning of that dream is Joseph, and Joseph is now promoted to prime minister. Let's then move ahead to Exodus. A new king began to rule in Egypt. He did not know anything about Joseph, the former prime minister. So the Egyptians made the Israelites work as their slaves. The Egyptian masters made the Israelites work very hard. They had to build cities for the king, Pharaoh, uh, where he could store for the king, who was Pharaoh, where he could store food for his people. After a long time had passed, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites were still slaves of the Egyptians. They cried out loudly and God heard them. And when they cried for help, uh, heard them when they cried out for help, he thought about his promise to take care of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and their descendants. God saw what was happening to the Israelites. He knew that he must help them. Okay, now we'll get forward a little bit further into the story. Next is chapter seven. Then the Lord said to um, Moses, look, I have made you like God to Pharaoh. Your brother Aaron will speak on your behalf like your prophet. You must say everything that I command you to say. Your brother Aaron must tell Pharaoh to let the Israelites go out of his country. If I'll make Pharaoh's mind become hard. He'll do many miracles. You, I will do many miracles in Egypt that show my power but Pharaoh will still refuse to listen to you. Then I'll show my authority. I'll punish the Egyptians. I'll bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt like an army. There you go, Charlton Heston telling Yalbrunner that's the way it was going to be. Then the Egyptians will know that I'm the Lord. I'll show my great strength in Egypt and I'll lead the Israelites out from there. So, dramatic story. You can see Charlton Heston there with the Ten Commandments. So you think God is now showing the example of bringing his people out from slavery. Surely then this is going to be his consistent position. But what do we find? The 10th commandment of the 10 commandments that you see uh, Charlton Heston and Moses holding there says, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, nor his manservant, nor his maid servant. We're already establishing that the Israelites are allowed to have man servants or maid servants, which I told you before means slaves. Jump ahead to Exodus 21. If thou buy a Hebrew servant, six years he shall serve, and in the seventh year he shall go free. But nothing's so good. We can see that um, <coughs> we can do, in fact, release them after six years of service. If he came in by himself, he should go out by himself. But if he were married, then his wife should go out with him. If his master, though, has given him a wife, and she have borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he should go out by himself. Now, that's a pretty tough one. Let's jump go to Leviticus, the continuing on law. Israel's people can buy male and female slaves. 
these slaves must come from other countries. An Israelite can buy people from other countries who live among them. They may have children who are born in your country. You can buy them. They will become slaves. Notice here, compare that with the last two slides. It seems there are a distinction on race too between who can be full-on slaves for life and those who are of the same uh, race as, as Moses, uh, who can only be held slave for six years. So it does seem there is a distinction between races in terms of slavery. You can give the slaves to your children when you die, but you must rule Israel's people in a kind way. So it does seem to be some distinction, as I say. Look, that's where I'm going to stop with the uh, Old Testament. There are other instances, examples of slavery throughout. But I do need to know that we're going to keep moving along. What the New Testament says on slavery. Let's turn, with, let's start with Lord Jesus himself. Mark 10. He said to them, you know the things that rulers of other countries do. The leaders of these countries use great authority over their people. But you should not be like that. Instead, the person who wants to be great among you must become like your servant, which in the Greek is, which the New Testament is written, means doulos. You are to become like a, a doulos. And a doulos was the common word for slave in the Roman world and the Greek world as well. So we are to become like slaves. We're no longer talk about talking about taking slaves, we are ourselves to become like slaves. Anyone who wants to be the most important person among you must work hard for you all. Even the Son of Man came to earth to be a servant to other people. Jesus himself is saying he himself has come to be a doulos. Luke 17, think about this. You may have a servant that is plowing your land or taking uh, care of the sheep. When he comes in from his work in the evening, you should not say to him, sit down and eat. Or you would not say, sit down and eat. No, you would not say that. You would say to your servant, prepare my meal for me. Dress yourself properly and bring the food to me. I will eat and drink first. You can eat when I have finished. Servants should do what their masters tell them to do. When they do that, their masters do not need to thank them. It is the same uh, with you. So again, Jesus is, <laughs> is actually saying, is not only that slavery is okay, but says that we should be slaves. Our attitude should be that of slaves. Paul's teaching on uh, slavery. Each of you should continue as you were when God, uh, when you, God called you to him. You may have been a slave when God called you. That does not matter. But if you had the chance to become a free person, accept it. And in the Roman culture, yes, in the Roman organised world, there was a possibility the slave could become a free man. The Lord may call a slave to come to him. Then that, what that's, that slave has become free. Uh, then that slave has become free because he belongs to the Lord. In the same way, when God calls a free man to become to Christ, he comes Christ's slave. So you see, there is actually the uh, mirror image there. If we are a slave, then before God, we have become free. If, in fact, we're a free person who's bowed the knee to Christ, then we've become Christ's slaves. Slave. God brought you for himself. He paid the price for you. So do not let anyone else make you their slave. The only slave owner, therefore, really is God himself. My Christian friend, each of you should continue as you were when God first called you to come to him. Remember that you serve God. That is our attitude. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6, we have a similar verse. You who are slaves, obey your human master. Respect them and be afraid of uh, I'm sorry, I'm afraid of them. Work well to help them as if you were working for Christ as your master. Do not do good work for good work only uh, when you can, they can see you. Instead, work well all the time as slaves who serve Christ. Work in the way that God wants you to work. Be happy to obey your human masters. Remember that you are serving the Lord himself, not just other people. 
You know that anyone who does some good thing will receive a good gift from the Lord. This is what happens, whether that person is slave or a free person. Now, I think this is one of the key verses that will come out later as we look at um, John Newton and William Wilberforce. You who are masters, be good to your slaves in the same way. Do not frighten them with punishment. Remember that both of you and your slaves have the same master in heaven, and he is always fair when he judges people, whoever they are. That's an important point too. And then, as I mentioned uh, at the opening, um, we do have the example of what happened into the book of Philemon. Paul in prison writes to a Christian slave owner, Philemon, who lived in Colossae in southern Turkey today, asking him to forgive his runaway slave, Onesimus. And in fact, most slaves had a name that was actually uh, something that related to their usefulness or their, their, just the fact that they were people who were there to do things. It appears Onesimus stole from Philemon and ran away to Rome, which at that time was, in fact, remained the great cesspool of the empire, only to find Paul under whom he was converted to Christianity. The Roman penalty for a runaway slave was death. Paul asked Philemon to accept Onesimus back as a fellow Christian, albeit as someone who would continue working as Philemon's servant. So what does Peter say? I didn't want to just focus on um, the Lord and Jesus and, and Paul, but let's see what Peter says. You who are slaves must obey your masters. Always respect them. Do that, to, uh, do that to every kind of master. Obey those who are good and kind, but also obey masters who are not fair to you. That's the tough rub, isn't it? This makes God happy. Maybe your master will punish you for, uh, when you have done nothing wrong. But if you know that you are serving God, you should continue to be patient and brave. But if you do something wrong, then your master ought to punish you. That is only fair. Even if you are brave when he hits you, nobody should praise you for that. But you may have trouble and pain because you have done good things. Then God will be happy if you are patient and brave. When God chose you to be his servants, he wanted you to be brave like that. Christ had trouble and pain on your behalf. He's shown you how you should live. You must be patient and brave like him. Now, of course, that's the really tough verses. Um, yes, it's great if we have a, a kind master or some kind boss or whatever, but uh, Peter's saying that we've got to be continued to serve him, um, even if we're our boss or our master is not good to us. Okay, thus end of the lesson from the Bible. Now, earlier on, I led you through the... Um, uh, the Adventist uh, description, Darius, I forget his Polish name, of description that it was the Calvinists in the first Great Awakening in the US who were largely pro-slavery. And then the Arminian uh, came later at the time, just before the, uh, the Second Awakening came just before the uh, US Civil War. And they were the ones who uh, agitated and eventually got slavery abolished. So surely the Calvinists would maintain their uh, doctrine that uh, if we're going according to the Bible and indeed given that there is a future hope that we can, we don't need to worry if slavery is still here. So let's look at John Newton and William Wilberforce. Born to a London shipmaster in 1725, he went to sea at the age of 11 with his father. He joined a ship in the Mediterranean trade, uh, but was pressed into the Royal Navy service as a midshipman. For those of you, I guess most of you know, uh, the Royal Navy would send its ships to sea, often missing a full complement of men, and they would send teams ashore, various ports, and drag anyone they could see and drag them into the Navy. That's what it's called being pressed. He tried to desert, was given eight dozen lashes, suffering disgrace and humiliation, and may I say a great deal of hurt. Eight dozen, what's that? 12 eights, 96. That sounds very painful. He then jumped ship to a slave trader bound for West Africa, but was abandoned there with a slave dealer who gave him as a slave to this slave dealer's wife, an African princess. 
Newton later recounted this period as a time he was one, a once an infidel and a libertine, a servant of slaves in West Africa. In 1748, he was raped by a sea captain sent by his father, but on the return journey, was caught in a dreadful storm off Ireland and feared he would drown. He prayed to God and the storm subsided. Despite this, his conversion, because he did say, right, thank you, Lord. He became first mate then of slave ships to West Africa until 1754 when he suffered, or so first mate there and also a captain of slave ships. And then uh, some six years later, then he suffered a stroke and had to give up. Only then did he take up his calling to ministry and encourage many with their faith. Finally, in 1788, 34 years after the trade, Newton broke a long silence on the subject. The publication of a forceful pamphlet, Thoughts Upon the Slave Trade, in which he described the horrific conditions of the slave ships during the Middle Passage, the trip from West Africa to Caribbean plantations. I'll just explain a bit about the Middle Passage. The British merchant ships ran most of the slave trade. The first passage was the, the trade, it was the ship down from Britain down to Africa, in which they would bring goods to trade to the African nation so they could purchase slaves. The Middle Passage was then when they transported the slaves across the Atlantic to the New World. And then the final passage was the one back from, and they'd load, then load up cargo from the plantations in the Mediterranean and uh, bring it back to sell in Britain. So the middle passage is where the slaves were on board. He apologised for a confession which comes too late. It will always be a, a subject of humiliating reflection to me that I was once an active instrument in a business of which my heart now shudders. He said, had copies sent to every member of parliament. The pamphlets had sold so well that it, it swiftly required reprinting. He was also a major encouragement to a young member of parliament, William Wilberforce. And of course, most of us know him for his hymn, Amazing Grace. Now let's turn to William Wilberforce. He was born to a wealthy merchant family in Hull, England, and had some exposure to evangelical preaching in boyhood. He attended Cambridge University and became a friend of William Pitt the Younger, a future Prime Minister, who encouraged him to consider politics. When his father died, he inherited his father's wealth, and in 1780, at the age of only 21, and while still a student, spent £8,000 to get elected to the seat of Kingston on Hull. Now, this is, a, 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 this is what I, one of the reasons I really appreciate his character. Because of his wealth, he decided to remain an independent, so he was not obliged to any party policy. He enjoyed the good social life at the wealth brings until he read the rise and progress of religion in the soul during a family holiday on the French Riviera at 24 years of age. He had a deep conversion experience. At that time, evangelicals were ridiculed. So he sought the guidance of his future, uh, on his future in Parliament from both John Newton and his friend, the new PM, uh, William Pitt the Younger, both counseled him to remain in politics and he resolved to do so with increased diligence and conscientiousness. Now, there's a testimony, isn't it? So, he was often distrusted by the progressive Whigs because of his conservatism and also regarded with suspicion by many Tories who saw evangelicals as radicals bent on the overthrow of the church and state. At that time, Britain was dominated by the, at that time, Britain dominated the Atlantic slave trade, and I did say that earlier. In 1783, William Wilberforce had met Reverend James Ramsey, a ship surgeon who'd become a clergyman on the Isle of St. Kitts in the Caribbean. What Ramsey had witnessed on the conditions endured by the slaves, both at sea and on the plantations, horrified him. 
Four years later, Christian friends asked Wilberforce to introduce a bill banning the British slave trade. He was reluctant to take the lead, but, it put, it, but, but put it to William Pitt, Prime Minister, and the future PM, William Grenfell, as they sat under a large oak tree on Pitt's estate in Kent. And that's the place where they sat. It's preserved to this day, that seat. Uh, it's very encouraging to note that um, William Grenville was a Whig, became a Whig Prime Minister. So it is encouraging when we see men of opposite political persuasion, William Pitt, the Tory, and a future PM, um, a Whig PM, soon together with an independent, William Wilberforce. And that's the place where Pitt challenged his friend, Wilberforce, why don't you give a notice of motion on the subject of the slave trade. You have already taken great pains to collect evidence and are there fully entitled to the credit, which is which doing so will ensure you. Do not lose time or the ground will be occupied by another. And one of the things I have learned as I prepared this is not only the character of William Wilberforce, but the character of William Pitt the younger. A guy, well, in his 20s still at this time. Um, William Pitt, remember, took over uh, just after the American War of Independence, um, a country that had lost a war, had lost its ability to send slaves anywhere, um, it's, it, convicts anywhere, but, and so he certainly had taken on a great challenge. But he himself was one of the inspirations for making sure that the abolition of slave trade went through. And, and by the way, um, uh, for those that might be listening to this, if they listen from overseas, as an Australian, um, we should remember that it was William Pitt, uh, the younger, that uh, endorsed the first fleet to come and settle Australia in 1788. So um, we Australians, um, who certainly cherish the uh, Aboriginal heritage that we have, but also uh, should recognise this character, William Pitt, the younger, who uh, did send um, the first... Um, white settlers out to Sydney Cove. Um, not only that, you'll get them over here. Due to Wilber Wilberforce's ill health, he had colitis, so he well, in fact, he took what we could date call opium to help with the pain. He was absent from Parliament. And Pitt himself introduced the preparatory motions and ordered a Privy Council investigation of the slave trade, followed by a House of Commons review. In 12th of May, 1789, a year afterwards, William Wilberforce made his first major speech on the subject of abolition in the House of Commons, in which he reasoned that the trade was morally reprehensible and an issue of natural justice. Those were the reasons he chose. He didn't try to argue from the Bible. It was moral, uh, the moral repre reprehensible nature of it and natural justice. He described the appalling conditions in which slaves traveled from Africa. I think most of you probably have heard, but they were stuffed down into the hold, uh, barely fed. Uh, I think it was something like 10% of them died traveling across the, the Atlantic. He argued that abolishing the trade would also bring an improvement to the conditions of existing slaves in the West Indies. Notice if you become a, uh, a commodity that's not being replaced, you rise in value. He wasn't trying to abolish the, you know, loose the existing slaves in West Africa, but to make them more valuable so that they would indeed be cared for uh, with under more, uh, better conditions. Just a slight aside here, the first people to actually abolish slavery in Europe were the French after the um, uh, bloody slave uprising in Haiti at the time, of course, in 1794, the French Revolution had happened. So give credit to the French, they were the first one to actually abolish slavery. After many delays, the Slave Trade Act received royal assent on the 25th of March, 1807. If anyone has not already seen it, um, the movie Amazing Grace um, does a very good portrayal of that. Okay, so we've linked through there, we've seen the actions of Christians um, who were initially Calvinist, but who saw the uh, the horror, the, the great cruelty that was being done in the name of their nation, and they took action. And so that's something that we must give credit for. It's the 
you know, we are required to be kind as masters. And if we see something that is cruel, then we have a duty to stand against it. About 10 million West African slaves were taken by Europeans over 350 years. About 17 million East African slaves were taken by the Islamic slave trade over 1400 years. Arabic slavery goes back at least to the time that Joseph was sold as a slave by his brothers to the Ishmaelite, that is Arabic traders, probably due to demand for slaves in Egypt. But of course, to be fair here, Joseph's brothers were at least as culpable as they initiated the sale of Joseph into slavery. Like the Bible, the Quran makes numerous references to slaves and slavery, and I've got some references there. Like the Bible, the Quran assumes permissibility of owning slaves, which uh, was an established practice before its revelation. The Quran does not explicitly condemn slavery or attempt to abolish it. Nonetheless, it does provide a number of regulations designed to ameliorate the situation of slaves. So to be fair, yes, they're, they're, um, there's an equivalence here. The prophet himself kept a slave concubine, Maria the Copt, who was given as a gift by the Roman governor of Alexandria, much as Abraham had Hagar. So again, we can't see much difference in some respects there. European practice of slavery was largely instituted after the discovery of the new world by Columbus in 1492, but was then abolished by the endeavours of the Quakers and the evangelical, evangelical Christians, such as William Wilberforce, and then the US Civil War by 1863. As I said, about 10 million West African slaves were brought to America, of which 2 million died due to the cruel means of transport and hard work. The male-female ratio uh, of in the uh, European slave trade was approximately two males or three males to every female. Islamic slavery has lasted some 1400 years and moderate Islamic states have abolished slavery, but only in the last 60 or 70 years after they emerged from the Ottoman Caliphate. 17 million East African slaves were traded with a higher proportion of men for use as concubines. Male slaves taken by the Ottoman Caliphate were often castrated. Islamic slavery is still practiced to this day in certain parts of Africa and the Middle East. As of 1980, and this is probably a little bit dated, 90,000 black Mauritanians remain essentially enslaved by the Arab Berber owners in Northwest Africa. In Sudan, Christian captives in the Civil War up to 2005 were often enslaved and female prisoners are often used sexually, with their Muslim captors claiming that Islamic law grants them permission. Same applies uh, during Islamic State's recent rule in Syria and Iraq. We know what happened to the Yazidis, very sadly. Uh, and may I add, uh, even just in the last two years, we should remember northeast um, Nigeria, where those 200 schoolgirls were captured by Boko Haram. And indeed, even just last week, it was, I think I read another Christian village, northeast uh, Nigeria, uh, was attacked. The pastor and none of the men were slain, and a number of the women have been taken off. We can only think what they're going to be used for. And then we can also read some records from David Livingston. Remember, not just a great preacher, but also a, uh, an explorer of Africa. He lived in the Lake District, ran um, Lake Victoria and thereabouts. He recorded the following in the Great Lakes region. 1866, we passed a woman tied by the neck to a tree and dead. The people of the country explained she'd been unable to keep up with the other slaves of the gang and her master had determined that she should not become anyone's property if she, uh, if she recovered. It's 26th of June. We passed a slave woman shot or stabbed through the body and lying on a path. A group of men stood about 100 yards off one side, another woman on the other side looking on. They said an Arab who passed by early that morning had, got, had done it in anger at losing the price he'd given for her because she was unable to walk any longer. 
27th of June. Today, we came across a man dead from starvation as he was very thin. One of our men wandered and found many slaves with slave sticks on, abandoned by their masters for want of food. They were too weak to be able to speak or say where they had come from. Some were quite young. Now, okay, so I've, I've, oops, sorry, I've just got to go back one. Unfortunately, the sayings like that does not go down well with black uh, African-American activists in America. Historian and black power activist Walter Rodney has criticised the Arab slave trade label as a misnomer as it obscures the extent to which it was also a European slave trade. He argues that by 18th and 19th centuries, the East African slave network came to be dominated by European colonialists. Most East African slaves during the 18th and 19th century ended up in European-owned plantations around the Indian Ocean, such as Mauritius, Reunion, Seychelles, and the Cape of Good Hope, in addition to many taken to the Americas. Uh, this is Rodney Walter, the activist. Uh, note that the theme of his book, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. He'd already established what his aim was and therefore had to uh, try and disguise um, anything that might contradict it. Okay, now I'm going to a place that I visited ooh, probably about 10 years ago. I've only been to Italy once uh, and came to a place called Rapallo. It's the birthplace of Col uh, Columbus. And as you walk along the foreshore, uh, in the Cinque Terre is a bit round to the right there. There is this castle here. And then you go and read about what it's there for and you realise it was to repair, repel Corsair slave raids on Italy. The Ottoman Empire sought and traded slaves from Europe across the Black Sea and up the Dnieper and Don rivers and by raids by Corsairs along the Mediterranean coast and Europe as far into the Atlantic as Iceland. Between 1 million and 1.25 million Europeans were captured by Barbary pirates and sold as slaves in North Africa and the Ottoman Empire between the 16th and 19th centuries. I uh, have to admit, I have Irish heritage, so the next um, item does strike home. In June 1631, Corsairs from Algiers and armed troops of the Ottoman Empire stormed ashore in the little harbour village of Baltimore. In fact, it's almost on the very southern tip of Ireland. They captured almost all the villages and took them away to a life of slavery in North Africa. The prisoners were destined for a variety of fates. Some lived out their days chained to oars as galley slaves, while women spent long years as concubines in harems or within the walls of a sultan's palace. Only two of these captives ever returned to Ireland. Hundreds of thousands of Hindu slaves, I'll just say, I'm not just defending my own race here, but uh, hundreds of thousands of Hindu slaves were marched over the Hindu Kush, which means death to Hindus, into slavery under Tamerlane and the Islamic Caliphate he founded in Central Asia. Whilst the vast majority, I'm taking this actually, if I'll just go jump down to the reference. I don't normally uh, adopt and go to um, uh, websites and I might not all normally quote Feminist Sexual Ethics Project, but uh, I found this particular part was actually, I think it was quite compelling. Whilst the vast majority of contemporary Muslims agree there is no place for slavery in the modern world, there's not been a strong internally developed critique of past or present slave holding practices. I'm just going to give one rap to this guy. In 2010 at the second, second Afro Arab summit, Libyan leader Muhammad Muhammad Gaddafi apologised for Arab involvement in the African slave trade, saying, I regret the behaviour of the Arabs. They brought the Arab children to North Africa. They made them slaves. They sold them like animals and they took them as slaves and traded them in a shameful way. I regret and I am ashamed when we remember these practices. I apologise for this. Full marks to Gaddafi. Of course, he's dead now. Um, we deposed him. At least he was one Arab who openly confessed 
to the practices. But modern Muslims have generally devoted little attention to thinking about or discussing the religious, ethical and legal issues associated with slavery, perhaps because it is difficult to acknowledge and confront the scriptural and traditional permission for it. Yet it is possible to analyse slavery as well as other forms of gross social inequality as inconsistent with the basic Quranic precepts of justice and human equality before God. The enslavement of human beings to other human beings is, in fact, marginal to the Quranic worldview. Right. Well, thank you for listening to me, folks. Um, I thought that would present what I've discovered, and uh, I certainly learned a lot as I prepared for it. Kevin, do you want to say something? After I unmute myself. Uh, so everybody else, uh, feel free to unmute uh, the microphones and I'll whack it up into gallery view. Um, and um, if, uh, for the time being, could you unshare so that everybody's visible? Sure, just bear with me. I'm just going to find out where I'm going to share. And, uh, so let me move a map. I'm trying to find how can I... Oh, no, there we go. It's at the top, isn't it? Uh, right. Stop share. Yep, there we go. There we go. Got it. All right. Uh, we'll initially just work through the um, chat comments. Uh, I think the first one is from Thomas Daly, um, and I think this might be a bit tongue-in-cheek. I don't even understand it. Could you explain this? As you know, I love IGM, except IJM. Uh, oh, yeah, the reference to IGM. I just uh, <coughs> I love that. Um, the, the thing is with IJM... Uh, what does IJM fact, stand for? Uh, International, International Justice, Justice Mission. All right. Okay. Yeah, and um, uh, and actually, I got a, a a brag moment here if I can, just for two seconds. I got a note from our daughter-in-law last night from um, from the Philippines uh, with a uh, headlines from the uh, Daily Telegraph in the UK, and they've just succeeded in getting um, um, uh, uh, reasonable sentencing laws for people who abuse kids online yeah. uh, in line with uh, in line if you if you're in person so basically if the victim was in the Philippines you got you know like a, a, a very small sentence but if the victim was actually in the UK you got a, a reasonable sentence and so they've actually succeeded in changing that Good. Um, Kevin th uh, thanks for a, that was a really interesting presentation um, but just what you said about IJM, yeah, they they say they want to end uh, slavery in our lifetime. That's an ambitious goal. I don't know if that's their expectation or that's their, just a goal. Um, but they're not really, they're paying ransoms. They're not rescuing indentured servants. There's a very big difference there. I think you'd appreciate. Okay. Hmm. Well, thank you, Tom. Well, look, all I'm saying, and now it is a year ago, so my memory may not be as uh, good as uh, I thought it was, but I certainly, my best recollection it is, it was about releasing someone, I believe it was South Asia, from a situation of indentured, um, indentured slavery. Yeah. So they were indentured to someone, they were not getting... Yeah, but, but it's not indentured servitude as like you might have in Deuteronomy or whatever with okay. Jubilee. Okay. It's where they've been duped or they've been uh, blackmailed or whatever. There's, okay. there's, no, there's, there's no consensual part of this. You've, okay. you've, it, it's, it is always an aggressive use of power and opportunity. And they're paying ransoms. Yeah. They're not paying out indentures. It's just a vast difference in what they're doing. Okay. And of Look course... There's controversy to that, right? Because when you pay, yeah, you're, you're actually making the, the the enterprise profitable. But it's really hard. I, I anyway, I, I just wanted to. That's a really important, uh, um, a really important distinction. That's all. Oh, well, thank you for that, Tom. Look, uh, as I say, I've only heard this one presentation, and I would admit that I don't know as much. And look, fully endorse any sexual slavery is well and truly abominable and must be stamped out. Goodness knows we see it here. Oh, oh, it's not just sexual slavery. It is servitude as well. We're in brick making right. and on Lake Volta. Yes. Um, yes. There's, there's lots of hotspots. India is, is terrible. 
Of course it is. Um, but anyway, just that, that's just the distinction. It's not, it's not old world indentured uh, servitude like you might have even had in, you know, in Dickens, Dickensian England yes. or, uh, or whatever. It's, it's, it's really you getting the power to ransom somebody. They're, they're paying ransoms, kidnapping yeah. ransoms, not, yeah. not paying out somebody's debt. Yeah. Okay. Now, well, thanks for that clarifying that. Oh, yeah, just a point of uh, clarification, like the word in uh, the New Testament for slave is doulos, uh, and it means both servant and slave. Um, but is that the same situation in the Hebrew as well, is it? Look, I, of course, they used, they used um, no, I don't know what the Hebrew word is. Is anyone here a Hebrew scholar that can clarify that? Well, I think Gordon's looking it up. Uh, but, um, um, yeah, but, but whatever it is, is uh, uh, the, the two terms equivalent in the Old Testament, do you know? Yes, uh, and you do find that, uh, I mean, I, I might hark back to the, uh, I think it was it was actually the parallel verses that talking about Abraham had a, uh, a servant called, or no, rather Sarai had a servant called Hagar. She offered him to Abraham because she herself was not able to bear children. And later on, in the book of Galatians, we learn that Hagar was a slave. So certainly Paul, who was obviously a Hebrew scholar, uh, interpreted that meaning to mean slave. Yeah, okay, it's just a minor point. Um, I think uh, Derek then made a very helpful comment. Um, Anesthesia is the oldest profession. God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. You are an ethicist, aren't you? I was. I'm, I'm, now, I'm now retired, but I still stand up for my colleagues. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it was um, Adam a gardener before God was an anaesthetist. Um, yes, not, not, not a bad point. Not a bad point. <laughs> All um, right, we'll move on. Um, and from Gordon, even a cursory look at Philemon shows that its argument is long defunct and irrelevant. Why then do we still regard it as a bona fide part of the canon of scripture? It would seem that parts of the Apocrypha are more relevant than Philemon. So, uh, Gordon, would you like to speak to that? You better turn, unmute your microphone. Uh, unmute your microphone. Oh, uh, I can do it for you. If I find you. Uh, done it. Here we go. Can you hear me? Yep, yep, yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, now, when was the canon of scripture established? Um, Brian can tell me. Was it about 400 AD or something like that? Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know exactly. At that time, when slavery was absolutely rife, I can well imagine why Philemon would be considered a, a valid um, book in the canon of scripture. From our 21st century perspective, I just don't see it at all. It, it just seems like an irrelevance to me. So I'm wondering whether, you know, over time, some books become more relevant and some, become, but some books become less. And it seems to me that uh, Philemon becomes very much less. Yeah, well, Philemon is actually one of Paul's undisputed letters. So, uh, oh, yeah, I'm sure he wrote it. Um, mm. But, yeah, yeah, I wrote a little bit down in the notes. It seems to me that... Uh, Paul's using a bit of a double standard here. Um, when he, uh, where was it? I think it was in Galatians 3, was it? He was talking about um, uh, in Christ there is neither, neither slave nor free, making a very clear point there. Uh, and he keeps to, it seems to be going against that in Philemon. So, you know, it looks a bit... <laughs> I think that's he wasn't good. quite very consistent there. I think that's confusing Paul quite a lot there. When he talks about neither slave nor free, neither male nor female, he was not denying that there were slaves and free. He was not denying that there are, is male and female. He was just saying that our status in Christ is all the same and that in Christ we are all the equivalent under their understanding of the law of a son and heir. Yeah, um, but, but isn't there an Im implied acceptance of reality of slavery as normality? in saying that? I mean, he doesn't come out and condemn it. Well, slavery was normality then and there, and yeah, there was yeah. a financial transaction involved in Philemon taking on Onesimus. 
Uh, that being said, in sending Onesimus back, he did also, if you read it more closely, suggest that he's not just a slave anymore, he's also a brother and should be treated as such. And uh, if there is any extra debt, Paul is saying, we'll put that to my account. So while he's saying this is how things are, he is also implying this is not how things should be. Oh, but look, I, I, I mean, it, it's not just for them. You've got Peter saying, look, you may have some bad masters. Um, sometimes like Jesus himself, who underwent, uh, you know, horrific punishment for something he was innocent of. Everything's going to be accounted for. I might be sound a bit repeated here. And this is, if you like, the uh, um, more of the Calvinist view. Yes, we might find it tough on this earth, but one day everything's going to be put right. Jesus himself tells the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. And uh, in the end, uh, the rich man, uh, sometimes I call dives, ends up down in the burning fires, whereas um, Lazarus is up there in Abraham's bosom. Uh, and I guess that's a Calvinist view. Yes, some of us may live very difficult, um, desperate lives even, but in God's eyes, it's what happens for all eternity that is so much more important than the few brief years we spend on this earth. Yeah, I just, the only thing that troubles me about that view is that God thought it was actually so important this time, this history and, 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 and this, this planet that he stepped onto it. Yep. Yep. I agree. And, and as I say, Jesus' words are, we should all be like slaves. And that, if you like, is the, you know, it's like a 4B2. It's a most of our pride. We mm. must all be like slaves. He himself said he was a slave. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, now, to another one from Gordon. The law of Moses regarding slavery was a distinct improvement on the later Roman law in which slaves didn't even have a right to marry or any other legal rights for that matter. Isn't there a big difference between a servant and a slave? Galatians 2, uh, 3.28 well, says... All right, well, I'll let you just talk to that, Gordon. Okay, well, that, that, that's three separate points, actually. Uh, I should have separated those. Now, uh, the first is that the concept of slavery in the Old Testament, uh, particularly in respect of the Mosaic law, uh, seems to be distinctly different from that, that of slavery under Roman rule, uh, in which, you know, uh, Moses actually said, you know, he specified certain rights that slaves have under Roman law. They just didn't have any rights at all. Uh, they, they couldn't even own anything. Um, you know, and they they may have married, may have been allowed to marry, but they didn't have a legal right to marry under Roman law. So, you know, when we're talking about slavery, we have to bear in mind that there are different kinds of slavery. Yeah. Uh, look, I might go back, Gordon, I think I'll, I might go one of the slides where um, this is describing a Hebrew slave, a Hebrew slave who is he'd be free after six years. If he came in married then he'd go out married with his wife but if he came in and his master gave him a, a wife then she was to remain behind with the children she's not free to go at the end of the six years and i can go back to no the, uh, you're right and uh, the slaves certainly didn't have a, a good bit of rights in their favor but they had some rights under the yes, they, did. They, did. they did i agree the interesting thing that I noticed is that um, something we consider a bit of an anachronism these days is the law of the Sabbath, where they are required to have one day of total rest every week. And in that law, it is very specifically said that includes the slaves. So in other words, built into the law was that the slaves had to have at least one day off a week. Yes. yes. Which is unheard of in any other context. Oh, yes. yes. I, I don't doubt it, yeah. But uh, again, uh, as much as I'd like to say otherwise, there is a distinction between a Hebrew slave and slaves from other countries, from other races. And that obviously does start to touch on... Uh, and look, let me go to what that Nigerian woman said right back, I think, in my that slide number five or so. She saw no problem at all with slavery in sub-Saharan African and would not at all criticise her... Um, I think it was her grandfather or great-grandfather 
for being a slave owner and for uh, believing uh, and, and not having anything to do with Western ideology that all men are equal. She said, no, it's not the way it was. And she's not going to criticise her great grandfather for being who he is. Um, all right. Um, yeah, you also made the point, Gordon, isn't there a big difference between being a servant and a slave? Well, that's how it seems to me. Uh, I think uh, Stephen sort of touched on that a bit, but uh, yeah, I, I would have thought there was a more distinct, uh, a bigger distinction between servant and slave yeah. in the scriptures. Yes, it's not just a question of the word, the Greek word. I think it's also context. I think Paul clearly talks about a slave in Christ as, as serving from a from the point of view of strength, from the will, from choice. Yes. I, I, I served, I desired to be your servant, to serve others from choice, from strength, not from bondage. Mm. I think that's the, I see that as the crux of the difference. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, when, when Paul opens Romans, he says, uh, well, quite often they say, Paul, a servant of Christ. And so it's the word doulos. So can, some do translate it, uh, Paul, a slave to Christ. Yes, but he, but he will. But he he also be close yeah. being from a point of view of strength where he serves. Yes. yes. They're like he, he is something he consented to. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, but a, but a kind of a slave was uh, someone who had no rights uh, of their own. And so, um, I, I think in one way he was saying that basically he was delivering to uh, fulfill his mission as being set apart by Christ. Just like a love slave. Yeah, yeah, that, um, that the, his whole reason for existence was to actually fulfill his calling. Um, all right. Um, I, I, I um, just, uh, you mentioned the rise of progress in the human soul, soul and I was just wondering who wrote it. It was Philip Doddridge, so um, Eric says. Um, now, uh, Gordon, you've been very active, Gordon. Uh, Muslim slavery still continues to this day in the Sudan. For all practical purposes, wives in Yemen uh, or Yemen are effectively slaves under virtually lifelong household detention, no legal rights. Do you want to speak to that, Gordon? Um, I think when we're thinking of slavery, we need to recognize that the kinds of style of slavery has changed over time. There's still plenty of, of slavery um, lying, thriving in the world today. Uh, and uh, there's, there's economic slavery, you know, numerous people in, um, from Bangladesh, uh, um, India, Pakistan and so on, working in the Middle East, for example, under appalling conditions, they have their passports taken away from them, they've got no rights while they're working there, and basically they're, they're just worked with, uh, with no, no mercy at all. It's, it's a terrible state to be in. That sort of thing happens. So there's economic slavery. There's also sexual slavery. Uh, and I'm th thinking of the fact that... Uh, sex determination and female abortion and female infanticide are on such a scale now that we're talking about hundreds of millions of people in India, uh, in China in particular, other parts of the world as well, but those two countries in particular, where men will never marry because there aren't enough women to go around because of all, the, uh, all this female infanticide. And consequently, that gives rise to a whole catalogue of slave-like circumstances. You know, um, brides for sale, mail order brides kind of thing. And, uh, and people going into prostitution and all kinds of slavery um, of that matter. Um, being duped into it. Uh, and it's it's a very lucrative business in uh, particularly in Asia, uh, also to some extent in Africa. So we shouldn't be blind to the fact. We certainly shouldn't be thinking that slavery has stopped. By no means has it stopped. It's just changed its character. 
Exactly. And look, if I may add, Gordon, of course, it's not just the Asian countries. I think uh, Eastern European women are being seduced or persuaded yeah, um, yeah, to come to the, the rich West where they will have a job. And the job is prostitution. They're uh, just like you've described happening in Asia. It's happening in our, uh, it's happening in Europe as well, in Western Europe. Um, I have a friend who I'm actually waiting for a call from who works for the AFP yes. and friends in the, in the US and who work in anti-slavery in Cambodia. And basically people have become far more profitable than drugs. Yep. yep. And IJM Rick um, uh, uh, actually estimates there's about 40 million slaves in the world today. But going back to uh, if, if one thing I didn't mention about what's happened in Arabia, they've done genetic um, testing of the, um, the population in the Arabian Peninsula. And uh, there is quite a deal of both European and uh, sub-Saharan African genes uh, mixed around with the uh, genes that are in, um, in Arabia. Um, obviously, sexual slavery has been, um, in Arabia at least, has been there for quite some time. All right. I, I've got a, um, a brief question. Is um, the biblical position defensible? Because wh uh, why this issue actually arises in the first place is it's um, an opportunity for uh, people to take pot shots at the Bible and say, uh, Bible condones slavery, therefore the Bible is bad. And so let's go elsewhere. Um, so um, it's, um, can you actually uh, have a defensible position of what the Bible says on slavery? Is there a way to actually... Uh, well, I'd, I'd like them to read that Nigerian woman's statement, see how they can accept that one. I mean, that goes against all the contradiction of Western liberal values, isn't it? To say, oh, my great-grandfather or grandfather, whatever he was, um, I'm not going to criticise him. He was a slave owner. That was his uh, culture. That's OK. Um, and yet where our own naval gazing is uh, so, um, you know, is so much going on. Um, yes, sexual slavery, bad, bad, bad. But um, um, labour, and look, I mean, I, I know about what happens in South Asia. Yes, as, in fact, Hindu, sorry, I'm going to be slight down here, but Hinduism with its caste system is very much uh, aligned to slavery. If you're a, a Dalit, sorry. You're, uh, you do whatever menial jobs have come along and you should be grateful for doing those menial jobs, you know, taking the latrine, empty, emptying the latrines and stuff like that. But, but to take Kevin's um, uh, question further, uh, Kevin, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, um, Stephen. Yep. So your response to a 12 25-year-old who says, and I have a number of these conversations, that says, I couldn't support Christianity because of its stance on slavery. Mm. How, do you, how do you respond to that based on your research? Okay, well, we, we looked, and let me go back to the Calvinist view, and as I've already pointed out, there were at least two Calvinists we know of, Wilberforce and Newton, who changed their view once they saw the cruelty of it. Um, I, I want to go back to Remember, we live in the West in a system with welfare. If you don't, did not have a job, probably going back even to before the Great Depression, you had to do find some way to survive. Now that we live on welfare, we think, oh, someone will always pay for my food, I'll be okay. But less than 100 years ago, if you did not have a job, you starved. Uh, I don't know if, if there's any watch Polar, great series there yes. from... Uh, Cool. But could, could, I, could I interrupt you? Just say, let's forget indentured servitude. Forget yes. that. Yes. Forget, forget that because, yes, I think that's a reasonable, a reasonable route. But if you leave that out and you leave out and, and you take the verses that you've highlighted that show it's fine to have a slave from a different yep. race or whatever and, yep. and they don't even get the Jubilee. Um, no, they don't. Uh, uh, they might get Sundays off or Sabbath off, etc. But... But how do you defend that to a 25-year-old? Because do, based I, on your presentation, I, I don't just think world view. much. We face, and I've, I've said a few times, I may sound like a broken record. The real important time in history is Judgment Day. Everything else we put right then. 
people who think there is no heaven, though, are sure, let's make everything right here on earth. And, and if you might, that was the Arminian point of view. Let's uh, let the gospel shine forth, let it have social progress, let the world get better and better and better. And I'm sorry, I just don't see that. I'm not seeing, I'm seeing it going the other way. Um, so that's why I'm more persuaded the Calvinist view is probably, from my looking at history, is probably the realistic view. Um, yes, you're going to have tough times on this earth, but just as Lazarus was lying at the gate of uh, the rich man in the parable, God one day is going to set everything right. Now, I know for a 25-year-old who's not a Christian, huh, what's heaven? We don't even, we only live in the materialist world. Sorry, there is a day coming when everything's going to be set right. I think I, I don't quite agree with Stephen about the Arminian view just being this idea that uh, we just keep making the world better and better. I, th I think that's, I think uh, even though Minions believe in original sin and that uh, we, we live in a very imperfect world uh, and things are not as right as they should be, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't do our best. I agree. I agree. In the world that we, in which we live, yes. in spite of its imperfections and spite, in spite of its failures, we still try to be, salt and light in our world but it's on the as an Arminian, i can still say that i don't feel like uh, i have to say uh yeah um have a sort of have colored glasses on and think our world's so wonderful i certainly don't think that at all <laughs> yeah, okay well thanks for that. i'm sorry Ronnie, I, I do um, we'd retract that implication um but on yeah look there is the view, as I say, as I read the scriptures. In fact, probably the one that was most convincing is 1 Corinthians 7, which, of course, is largely about getting married or not getting married. But Paul goes on to the broader scheme of what state you are in, stay that way. If you have a chance to get a big, gain your freedom as a slave, go for it. But if that doesn't happen, be happy to stay as a slave. And, and remember in the Roman Empire... Some of the most, uh, the folks that were poorest off were not the slaves because generally a master did try and keep them so they could keep working. It was the freed slaves who no longer had someone to give them their daily bread or daily food that were often in a much tougher position than most slaves. Not saying all slaves, but most slaves who were, at least there was, I guess, I was the right word, a, uh, it was an economic benefit in keeping your slave uh, well-fed and healthy so he could be a, a prophet to you in his life. So the slave in, in Roman times, um, now at least they had, they had a place, okay? The, their owners had a, gave them a place to live. A freed slave had nowhere exactly. to go. Exactly. Nowhere to go. Exactly. exactly. No, but I, I think you need to... I think we could all agree about indentured servitude in the old world, right? I think we should deal more with modern history and the, the Atlantic slave trade and even, and even modern. So, so, so Stephen, to press you a little bit further, still on, on Kevin's question, right? Um, so there were two presentations on objective morality last year. Yes. Um, one from our, esteemed colleague in the uh, bottom left hand corner on my screen yep. and and i think that most of us were agreement that uh, that objective morals actually existed exist yep. so from your position it's sounding like you're not finding anything objectively immoral about uh, about um uh, uh slavery yeah. uh, am i am yeah. i misinterpreting well, the ants do it. Sorry? The ants do it. That doesn't make it right. Yeah, that doesn't make it. There's other cruelty in the animal kingdom that I would not endorse. Yeah, and, and in fact, go to go back to objective morality, one of the points I think Brian and I made last year was that, you know, when a, when a, when a, um, uh, when a bear eats one of its young, it hasn't committed... Uh, infanticide it hasn't committed a moral crime because it has no moral duty right it's not a moral being 
but the, we are moral beings and I think most of us here would believe in divine command theory if some format I'm just wondering how you are parsing that because well, look if, if I were made a slave I would turn to the scriptures and accept the fact that my role in life at this moment is as a slave I mean and this is a practical I'm not talking about my attitude to the Lord as being a, a doulos to him, I'm talking about the fact that if I was, um, yeah, if I was in a position where I was required to do certain duties as part of how I kept my, you know, get got food on my table, I'd be happy to do that. But, but then, why support IJM and their Freedom Sunday, and why support the releasing of 40 million slaves in the fight against slavery today? That seems to be incongruous with the scriptures. Okay. Um, yeah, I agree. And that's where I say that, look, my own attitude was if I, look, the one instance I was quoted was this person who was not being fed well enough and all his family. And so he got out. Of, um, that's good. But if, as long as I had enough food, um, I would be happy to be in a position where I was uh, to me. If, no problem. Cause I look to eternity. That's my goal. That goes on forever. I'm not. Yeah. Being, I'm now seventy years old. Okay, um, fine, but not much longer from this. That's all over. Why don't we take a step backwards from slavery and just look at injustice? Um, enslaving somebody else is unjust. Uh, taking a slave and making it impossible uh, for them to ever get out of their slavery for your own uh, selfish purposes and mistreating them—that is unjust. Which is where. Um, IJM is coming into things. In the situation as was found, say, in Old Testament times, a situation where there was, as Stephen pointed out, no such thing as social security. Uh, there was no dole if you couldn't get a job. Uh, no work, no eat, family dies. Uh, so in that sort of context, people could sell themselves into slavery to pay off their debts. Uh, then they had a greater responsibility to their masters than did a straight servant. But at the same time, the master had a greater responsibility to that slave uh, to feed and house and that sort of thing for them as well. In that context, it was not unjust. Um, so cases where it is unjust, that is where it is wrong and we need to speak up. Um, cases like that, I think we need to accept that, that was just how the culture worked in those days. Mm -hmm. Is there a kind of a yeah. middle position uh, where you could uh, say, that you could argue that uh, slaves should be treated properly and justly. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, uh, rather than saying and uh, making a categorical statement that all forms of slavery are inherently wrong. Yeah. I, I think uh, I was just looking at that uh, text in Philemon, where Paul's writing uh, to Philemon. He says, although in Christ, this is um, verse uh, 8. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, mm. yet I appeal to you on the basis of love. Mm. Mm -hmm. I then, as Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who mm. became my son while I was in chains. Mm. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. Mm. And he goes on. Um, you know, if you're taking back, uh, you might have him back for good, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave as a dear brother. Yeah. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. So yep. he really is talking about, okay, if you're going to take him back, treat him like a brother. Yep. You know, he's not, he, he I mean, um, one of my lecturers, uh, uh, who's a conservative gentleman, uh, he argued that the New Testament in particular didn't abolish slavery outright mm. uh, because if if they attempted to do this it would have led to widespread bloodshed 
So it was better to monitor and control slavery to ensure that people, while this system continued as, as abhorrent as it is, people would at least get treated with compassion and and Paul's standard is to treat them like a Christian brother, not to be cruel. So he really opposed all the evil practices, but he did encourage proper and appropriate treatment and to treat one like a Christian brother, which puts a totally different standard on things. You have an obligation because you've taken, you've taken them all as a slave. You have an obligation to properly care and care for their needs. I, I, look, I accept that, Dr. Rodney, but I, I make the point that, and indeed, that's entirely consistent with the last part. I think it's Ephesians chapter 6, where yes. Paul does talk about how you should, how slaves should behave, you know, not with eye service, but with, uh, with heart service, as though they were working everything for the Lord. But separately, of course, masters, remember, to treat your slaves well, because one day you're going to have to sit before the judgment uh, on judgment day, yes. and each of you will give an answer for how you've treated um, each other. And so, yes, that, that's consistent. Uh, look, for a Christian slave owner, definitely. But in this world with non-Christian slave owners, then you get um, Peter's reminder. Look, if you get punished for doing wrong, well, you copped it. You deserved it. But if you get punished for doing um, what is right, then yes, that's going to be tough. But that's what Jesus asked because he's already set us that example. So if we've got a deal between Christian and non-Christian masters, um, as a Christian, if you are a slave, then unless you are, get access to freedom, 1 Corinthians 7, then be content to remain a slave. Um, Eric, um, I chopped you off. You are going to say something at one stage. Um, it's largely been covered, but I think one of the key things in New Testament ethics is to love your neighbour. And yeah. so if you happen to be a slave owner or whatever words you want to use instead of that, you've got the obligation um, to love your slaves. Um, and uh, and yeah, loving your neighbour doesn't stop if, if the... If, the neighbour is a different um, ethnic group or religion and, and nor does it stop um, if they're a different uh, social or economic class. Um, maybe, the reality, maybe the reality at this time was that you've been a slave for uh, many years. You've probably got no opportunities, no skills. You're totally dependent on your survival. Uh, and there should be an obligation as a Christian to take appropriate care and compassion towards your slaves. But then, then going from there, um, uh, when, when you see in a whole society where slavery is practised and where you see that slaves generally aren't treated well, the next step in, in people of goodwill loving their neighbours mm -hmm. is to try and push the society to say, no, this slavery thing um, is being abused or, or done in a bad way too much, and so we are better off abolishing it outright. Mm, cool. And that's and that's what most societies have done now. Um, but but even, uh, yeah, even back in the Old Testament, which which seems a bit harsher, there were still the rules about kidnapping someone for slavery. That was a capital offence, and so you can say that much of slavery as it was practiced, like the transatlantic slave trade, um, uh, yeah, where, where people were, were kidnapped for slavery, that, that breaks the Old Testament rule. So, so, um, so defending the Old Testament isn't defending the uh, slave trade. Uh, but I think only a hundred years ago, right. no real social welfare. I mean, sure, the Romans practiced, what was it, bread and circuses uh, to try and keep most of the free people quiet. But um, without a worldwide uh, social welfare, people need to do some work. And sometimes the boss is the one who will give you a job that will make you work as though you were had no very few rights. No, I think Eric's point is absolutely right, that our guiding principle 
yes. is uh, love your neighbor as yourself. Yes. Which, which raises the question, are we to treat a slave as a neighbor? Uh, I think most of us would say yes, and if that, if that is the it's case, then, then there's just no case for slavery. I think that was Jesus' implication. Yeah. yeah. But uh, going back to Jesus' own words, I, I think this has got a lot, uh, if I might go back, was it the US um, Declaration, of, uh, was it the uh, the rights, um, the, the right to happiness, was it? The right to, to happiness, you know, the, the three rights that come out of the U.S. Um, Declaration of Independence, um, right to seek happiness or something. That was something that, yes, it's there. Is it self-evident? I don't think everyone's going to have a good life. Um, we go through tough life. Some get better break at life than others. As I say, I, I'm looking forward not to this old world, which is so broken. I'm looking forward to the next one. Most of, all, most of us... Uh, getting on a bit in years, but yeah, uh, right. I, I, I think your attitude or anyone's attitude, attitude might be a bit different if they were much younger and plenty of life to look forward to. Uh, you know, the prospect of decades of, of serfdom, slavery is pretty daunting and grim for anyone. I, I, it's just not supportable to me. Uh, look, uh, Gordon, I'll explain a bit of my background. I, I joined the Defence Force at the age of uh, 18. Um, and the first year of a four-year course, you were the lowest form of human um, life possible. And if uh, one of the senior kids said, jump, jump, you said, how high? And you didn't ask mm -hmm. so anything else. So, so yeah, um, you, you go through boot camp or whatever else you call it, and it, it's pretty tough. And uh, admittedly, it was only the year, that first year, that that happened, but um, you do learn to accept that, yeah, you know, life can be tough. And uh, if you're told to do something, you do it straight away and don't query. Otherwise, it'll be much worse the next time. You enlisted, didn't you? Oh, uh, yeah, I joined uh, one of the Air Force, in fact, it was the Air Force Academy at the time, equivalent of ADFA, yeah. All right, I think uh, we might just um, um, call the formal part at the meeting uh, to a close. So uh, thank you very much, um, Steve. It was, uh, I learned a lot from listening to what you said. There was a lot there that I didn't know. Um, oh yeah, look, and uh, I appreciate, Mars, I, I appreciate all the contributions, all the uh, other arguments that, not arguments, the other points of view that were made uh, since I finished giving the uh, my particular paper. Yeah, so thank you very much. And at uh, uh, this stage, I'll terminate the uh, recording.